Welcome to the Emptive Podcast, where we chat about cloud-based solutions that make selling your e-commerce products easier, more profitable, and effective. Today, we're chatting about dynamic content. What is it? How is it used? And where do businesses get the information that drives it? We're also going to dig into some of the potential privacy concerns. And finally, we're going to close out the episode with dreaming about what the coming years could look like in the dynamic content world. Yeah, so what is... Uh dynamic content. In what we're talking about today, it's it's about content that changes based off of some sort of input of variables. Mm-hmm. And to the end consumer, what that means is is they're they're seeing different stuff based off of input of data. Um, so usually those variables are things like session data, behavior, interactions, um, location-based, geotagging, um, and sometimes it has to do with an individual user, that and sometimes it has boring. to do with just their location. <laughs> What'd you say? I said that sounds a little boring. I mean, but we would all want a <laughs> better shopping experience, right? And I think what you're trying to right. say is all of those variables should go in line to give us that better shopping experience. And and truth is, John, I don't think that has changed in 15, 20 years. I, I mean, it hasn't changed much. And uh, I think that, you know, the personalization that's available is pretty weak. But, yeah. Uh, I think that's what well, we're here to talk about, right? Yeah. yeah. And you grade it a little bit tougher than, than most I people. I do. I probably do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we used um, to do a lot of uh, variable data in print, you know, in the early days. And, and you know, so it's not new. And uh, we used to change the cover of, you know, financials for for different people based on, you know, their country or their income level or things. And, and I, I see, you know, those similar lines here on, on the internet, right. And, uh, on the websites, but I don't know, you know, how much that's actually really changed in 15 or 20 years, but yeah, go ahead. I mean, carry on. I mean, tell me how it might change. So I think it's let's, let's, so we, we, we kind of have an idea of like what dynamic content is, you know, it, it's changing. I, I use a very technical term, but I yeah. think for a lot of our listeners, it's you're changing things around on on a website or an application that's giving them different information. Maybe it's price. Maybe it's um, I don't know. There's a million of them Pictures, out there. Pictures, images, right? It, it could be anything. Yeah. Um, and we talked a little bit about what drives them, right? It's it's those different variables like geolocation, like how you're interacting. If I click on this, oh, it means I probably like this area right. of, mm-hmm. of category of products. So let me bring some of those categories up to the surface for you so you can yeah. easily easily find them. Um, I think nowadays dynamic content is very much focused on selling, sell, 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 sell. That's right. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think some of the creepiness yeah. comes in. And, and we're going to get more into this when we talk about some of the privacy No, but I, I think you're nailing it right there because it's everybody's impression is the only reason they're personalizing it is to try to sell me something. And I think, and that's just probably the wave one, right? We're talking about what would be the future. I think we have to work away from that a little bit or make it less a softer sell, right? I mean, because that's yeah. what I think of it. I'm like, oh, they're just trying to push something at me, you know? I think it's the motive, and, and right. you'll hear me say that again throughout the, yeah. this episode. You know, what is the motive behind right. the, the person utilizing the technology to create the dynamic content? Is it just to sell or is it to make a better user experience and purchasing experience? Right. Well, I think that's what we should focus on is the latter, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, some of the main things they're, they're trying to do with dynamic content is in, increase engagement. Mm-hmm. Make the customer cool. happy. It's not all. It is not all bad. The motive isn't just selling. I mean, a lot of it is, but it is also to make it easier. Make it easier, um, better. Mm-hmm. Right, and you know, recommendations and suggestions to give a better shopping experience. Um, it, and I kind of mentioned this before about showing you more products and categories, bringing them up to the top so you can see them. So now, why don't we go into? How is it being used and get kind of, and by who? Okay. Yeah. Um, Well, so I did a little research for, you know, our podcast today and I, I, you know, obviously the big ones are Google, right? I mean, it's, (laughs) I could stop the, 
it's Google, Amazon, Facebook. That <laughs> stop right there, right? Um, right. But but I think it's not fair because those guys also have all that data, right? They're they're a little, a little different than the average, you know, person who's listening to our podcast or people we run into. They're um, they're not like our clients. They they have all the data, so they can use that data to help them sell better, right? How I would say there are others that are like next down, which maybe uh, one of them comes to mind. It just came in the news like last week, uh, Target. Mm -hmm. They were accused of changing prices based on, it was really creepy. As as you got closer to the store, they knew you Mm. were going to go buy it. And so it would go up by a few pennies. Oh, wow. Strange. I mean, it's almost like it's not like an auction, but like. No, it's, it's kind of like increasing as you get closer to it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know exactly. I, I read it three times trying to figure it out. It had a lot of different, you know, uh, parameters to it. But the basic premise was obviously pricing is different in different locations. And that's what Target would say. <clears throat> but that's not what they were doing. They were doing more like with your app. If you have that app as you get closer or they know that you want that product more, it would go up in price. It's a hyperlocal, hyperlocal right. to the physical location of the store, That's not ge- geographical region region for pricing. And we've all, I think we've talked before and, you know, we've mentioned many times how you can, you know, dynamic pricing and changing the pricing based on, and everybody gets a different price. It's been around for a while. Yeah. Not heavily used, but not in... I never expected Target to use it. You know what I'm saying? I, I, that's just what I was kind of getting at. Um, and I think the airlines use a lot of the same technology, oh, yeah. right? And then um, it's 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 <clears throat> how I think what's interesting about the airlines is like what is there? I mean, obviously their motive is to like fill seats and seats, sell and right, make money, right. but sometimes it's bizarre. Like I've done looked at flight prices from just a computer and a phone and the mm. TV. And like trying to like comparing them them all like to, and they're different even within like the same IP address and obviously wow. the same ISP and um, right. one other thing though I think was interesting about um, Amazon uh, Google Google Facebook is they have a um, that extra data you were kind of talking about like that extra secret sauce mm-hmm. and I mean Google has all of that search data browsing yeah. history they have the most I know even. Say, yeah email and amazon has all those great order history archived chats with alexa um shipping addresses no geography music and content tastes if you use their their well they even track your voice now right so yeah Yeah. i mean yeah they get really detailed i think amazon would be up there with google they may not have the traffic in for data but they have all this extra data with alexa and all these other you know devices and apps um I didn't want to get you off talk. No, off no, topic. you didn't. And, you know, <laughs> Facebook can you know rely on Instagram and other things to feed itself too, and it has its own advertising oh. and search. So, and contextual um, data, which I think yeah. is cool about Facebook, they can kind yeah. of put it into your life and put it into your friends, and mm-hmm. also show a community of interest too, right. which is is kind of cool. I think you know. The, if I bring it down to the level of, you know, a, a large e-com store, but not one of the biggest and not, you know, some Fortune 500 company. I mean, I think that we're all sort of using these tools and tricks and personalization. I mean, we've been using them for years, but it hasn't changed much. I guess that's my argument, right? It's you personalize the email, dear Dave, you know, or you when I get to the website, hey, Dave, you're back. Welcome back. I'm not saying we don't use it. That really wasn't my premise. It was more of... um I don't think we use it well, and I don't think we use it enough. I guess that's where I'm really basing. And I'm not even really sure Amazon does a good job. I mean, I can complain about, you know, when I go on there, I see crazy stuff. I'm just saying that um, I think the average person, the average store, you know, the store owner that we're talking to really could be using it more. And I think that's kind of where I'd like to focus the topic for today. Yeah. And Um, how? so how are some of the ways like, they're using yeah, that. I, I know you I mentioned found, like, I found some good ones. I did. Okay. I thought I did. Uh, well, Fit My Foot, which was like, um, I think more like Nike, uh, where they, you know, you do a, take a picture of your foot or you give them some kind of input and then they personalize your experience for you. It sounds really, you know, and now I have to take a picture and send it in. But there's okay. also, it, there's a few other examples like that where you take a picture of your body or you know, of a particular piece of clothing, and then they can kind of, they have apparently 
better than a tailor. I was like kind of amazed at that, but they, they have oh, some yeah. technology that they're employing. Um, Bombfell was one, uh, one I never heard of, but it, they, they do a style survey. And this is one I, I, this is where I start to feel that we, you know, we could really utilize in, in, in the market now. But they actually ask the person, what do they like? What is your style? And they kind of figure it out. And then they start handing you stuff um, based on Do they your show answer. you, do they mm-hmm. show you different examples of things and ask exactly. you what you yeah. like? Yeah, I yeah. think they kind of, I think they do the survey. I haven't done it, but I think they're more or less showing you, do you like this? Yes or no? You know, swipe left or swipe right, light. Right, and, oh, right. And then I think uh, I heard the opposite version of that for the for the women would be stitch fit fix stitch fix and <laughs> i can't say i have things, heard but, of it yeah, yeah and they do a little bit better they also do the same kind of thing they ask you here, here they think of that marvel concept they kind of ask you a lot of questions get to know you a little bit and then they also empower a little bit of ai and okay. you know you know me i kind of love that thought so they they take that and then they look at other people that are like you. And so they're like, oh, well, if you're like this person, I know you didn't say hot pink, but hey, how about this? And they right. found that it really, really works because they kind of, they're they are not really sitting there judging you. They're just saying, well, you're a part of that group and this group happens to like it. And you might not have thought of this. Why don't you yeah. try it? You know, I thought that was brilliant. Um, weather front was, um, well, no, wealth front. Yeah. So oh, wealth front. front. Yeah, yeah. Wealth front, which I think in the financial industry, a lot of a lot of people have been using this. And I, I think it's a little bit of something that was probably required, you know, um, by the FCC or something. They have to ask you, you know, how much you know income do you have? Uh, are you comfortable with a certain level of risk? Some legalities, right? I th- I think because the, the the questions are almost always the same, but I think wealth front takes a little bit further and. Um, they use an app and they ask you a series of questions to customize your investments. I think you'll find that in a, a lot in the investment arena. I really yeah. do. Um, a fun one, fun one was Gatorade. Now, it yeah, may have I been, this might old. be old because I haven't seen it lately, but I read about um, a sweat patch that you would put on your body mm-hmm. and it would analyze your salts and your mineral, what you're excreting when you exercise. Okay, like and biometrics. Then, Right. It's all biometrics. And then they would sort of tell you what you need to do. Um, I'm not sure how much that was for the masses or it was probably just a study or, you know, a quick idea. Yeah, you can buy you, you can buy them. I mean, they're they're pretty cheap, too. Like 20 oh, yeah. bucks, 30 oh, okay. bucks, something like that. Um, I, I'm and then curious. it syncs with your phone um, for like fluid yeah, loss, with an app sweat rate right. and sodium loss, too, to just give oh. an overall picture of like hydration. Um, it's a great sweat idea. rate stuff like that um now that's a little outside of because you have to have an extra thing an app and it's probably a little bit outside of you know the you know average stores comfort zone but i get the idea where they're bringing see there's something that you can bring into the mix that really helps with your product i think it's you know it adds value well they collect Um, a lot of that information they they kind of create a profile to start and then once they create that user profile with all the input data and questions, it mm-hmm. then backs some of that up and mixes it with the biometrics it's getting from the device to kind of like right. put together a picture of you, a unique picture of you. And I think this is, right. biometrics is just one way to do it, but like in a shopping experience across the, the board, you can do the same vibe, I think, which is what you're saying. You're pulling in that asking those basic questions to the user and then something is happening, some magic in, in the middle with some AI and pulling in data from other places to then deliver a custom uh, right. result. Okay. Or in yep. this instance, the result is to help you shop. Um, it should be to help you, not help them sell. Obviously, you know, we, we all want to help the retailers sell, but, but it should be something that's beneficial to you, I would think. You know, um, Whole Foods does one where they... And I have that app, but I, I don't use it enough. But I think they <laughs> yeah, I store <laughs> everything you've ordered and they recommend, oh, you're running out of milk or, you know, stuff like that. But it's, it's all again, integrated too with the Amazon helpful. app also. Oh, I'm sure they'll deliver yeah. it. Right? <laughs> Just well, you can even like shop Alexa. in there too. It's so <laughs> weird. Now it's mixing in my, my Whole Foods purchases with my regular Amazon purchases. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Which is annoying. No, I hate it. I can't stand it. I'm like, this is a different life. Like they're not, they're, yeah, I don't I want them to mix. 
The last one I had was uh, Care Of, and I think their their URL is uh, Take Care Of, right? Um, oh, okay. And it's and I thought this one was good because this kind of fits what I was sort of saying. This probably hits at home a little bit more. They do a survey. They actually think about it again, a model concept. They ask the customer about their health, their lifestyle, what they do, and then they formulate a, uh, a good plan for what vitamins to pick and, you know, what to use and how to use them and when to use them, which, um, you know, I, I have to say that that kind of really goes to home because would you walk into a you know a store or go online you just have no idea right you know right. you know the milligrams you need so that is a clear i might have had to give up some information but i think i get more back in that exchange you see what i'm right, saying right that's an exchange where i think it's and that's the part i'm talking about is a fairness of the exchange and what do i get back equal to what i gave you uh then i think it's less creepy less salesy and, you know, you're still selling and you're still making money. That's what we're here to do. But on the other hand, I think the customer experience is far superior, you know. Well, that's when you can see the the value, right? right? Whatever that value is. I think sometimes when you pull it up to the front and you're open about it, the customer can then see the value and see the connection. Whereas if you kind of keep it behind the scenes and, and, and keep them in the dark, that's when it's seen as more of the creepy. creepy. Right, and that's it's interesting. It's just the same data a lot of the times. But what's the the perspective that is shift shifted? Well, John, how much control do you think you have over Google's data? I mean, well, right, right, none. I mean, none. I mean, even if they tell you and they'll tell everybody that you do, and blah blah blah. And you know how last time you read their twenty, thirty, forty page terms of agreements and bull, you know, blah 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 personalization. Right. I mean, unless yeah. you went to law school in the last spare time, the last couple of weeks, I mean, you wouldn't even understand what the gibberish is. So or have the free time to read. No. <laughs> They're like so, ridiculous. Right. So clearly that's not a working model that's going to succeed for too long. I think it's it's starting the backlash already, I think. Right. Well, in some of the you were saying some of the countries and stuff like yeah. have, you know, put some laws in place put some breaks on that right yeah eu but is different than the us and how much like does it really i mean i kind of think like the yeah. some of the rules like you, you have to be able to I, I think they're great you should have some freedom and you should have some control over your data um but like it's not always removing some of the um ambiguous like contracts and agreements that Language are and, yeah yeah and it's like do you agree to it? yeah i accept the cookies what am i not gonna shop and my, of course I accept them. It's sort of like they're holding a gun to you and they're like, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. But like, you have to do, you have to accept you it. Have like to. What, right. Like, yeah. Well, I think you've brought it up many, many times. And I think it comes up in a lot of these uh, podcasts that we have where, you know, you want to be able to see your data and you want to be able to change it. Right. And, 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 you know, cause it could be wrong. That's the same thing like the credit report kind of nonsense. Right. Or, oh, yeah. You know, it's like we have all this data, but we're not going to let you know. And hey, it says here that you like seafood, even though, you know, you're highly allergic, right? You, know, you can't change it. It's always going to send you stuff on seafood. And it's like, well, how do I stop this? And you can't, yeah. you know, and I think that's the part of the problem. So let's, let's as we go into the, the privacy concerns, let's go, let's, let's first kind of say, uh, take a look at how some of this how they track yeah, that's a good some of this. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of words and terminology that I think is thrown yeah. around. Um, so some of the main ways uh, companies do it, geolocation, that's just, they know where you are. They have a good idea based off of a couple different things, your mm -hmm. IP address, your internet service provider, or even your GPS on some yep. computers and or phones. Your app or your phone. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And then there's like even triangulation, which is a kind of another way that Apple used to do it back in the day. It's like not real GPS, but it's kind of GPS yeah. using the, uh, you know, a satellite or using different um, uh, cell towers to right. triangulate where you are. Um, there's kind of, you'll hear brow browser storage, cookies, mm -hmm. um, kind yeah, of the... Yeah, yeah, they're the they're the the, the popular ones, and cookies get a bad rap, um, and and for some good reasons, um, they're very helpful and they they can be harmful. I, yeah, I mean, right, it, right, yeah. And some of the things that these um, it, that they're actually tracking some of the data, um, you know, what browser you're using, what operating system you're using, 
the behavior, where are you clicking? What are you clicking on? Um, did you put it in your cart? Did you purchase it? All those right. track events. How long were you on a page, right? Yeah. Sure. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you get deeper into it, it, it's some of the historical information, past right. orders, past chats, past customer service requests. Um, yep. I'm, I'm and they even know up. where you're coming from, which is cool sometimes. Like if you're clicked from one website to another website, they know they're referring oh, yeah. cross, URL. Cross, yep. Yeah. Cross yeah. yeah. So uh, there's, there's even this uh, sort of offline transactions, which could be anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be a purchase. That's where it can get a little bit more creepy, yeah. I think. Yeah. So you I mean, click around, you're not technically online, but as soon as your device gets back online and you refresh the page, it sends the information back to Couldn't the, that also be, I bought data on you and I just, you know, used it. <clears throat> you know what I mean? It could come from a third party or another place, right? And well, that, right. Yeah. But I guess that's, that's it being aggregated. This is more of sitting in like, if we're sitting in the browser and like, oh, okay, I'm using saying. an application or something, and I'm not online right now, or I'm flying on the airplane and I'm in airplane mode, but when I get off, all those track events and all that data right. is a lot of times ding, pushed ding, up. Ding, ding. Yep. So yep. you know, even if you shut I it off, yeah, yeah, they're still getting yeah. Um. So, I I, I think I'm going to bring this one topic up now about Google because it's very much in the news right now. I'm, uh. They kind of are changing the way that people are being tracked when they're using their Chrome browser. And this is sort of a, a, a big deal because traditionally the browser has been a window into the internet. Mm-hmm. I mean, Dave, you watched a million of them, you know, fall and rise, Netscape, go, Opera, yeah. you know, Firefox, they're still around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it's traditionally been a pretty sterile environment where you just – you go in, you log in, and it, it provides a better experience by its efficiency. But it usually doesn't get involved with data and tracking too much unless it's protecting the user. Mm-hmm. So what, what Google is, is doing is kind of changing the way people are being tracked. And they couldn't just turn off cookies, which is kind of a, a thing now that's a hot topic. People kind of want to be like, oh, don't use cookies, crush cookies. But... Google couldn't do that because so many of their third, uh, yeah. like so many third parties and so much competition relies on cookies. And Google, they don't need the cookies as much because they already know you're already logged into Google. You're already using the search platform. So it could be seen as they're doing it to hurt their competition. Mm-hmm. And with all of the backlash that they're getting from the federal government right now and privacy and control, they they sort of traipsed into it a little bit differently. And they tried mm-hmm. to change the way that they're doing it. And they came up with this name. What is it called? I don't know I've written it down. It's our it's Flo Flow C F L O C. But it stands for Sounds doomed to start. <laughs> Google's <laughs> Federated <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. Federate learning of cohorts. Um, so yeah. what does flock. it do? Flock. Flock. Yeah. Maybe it's flock, not flow C. <laughs> well, no, I think it's probably flow C, but I'm calling so, it flop. big flop. Yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah. People don't. I heard it didn't go over very well. No, right? no, 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 no. And so essentially what they're, they're trying to do is use Chrome to assign you when you're shopping or browsing or using the internet into a specific cohort or group of people yeah, with right. similar interest. Right. You know, if an advertiser wants to target somebody who is um, who likes to buy expensive vacuum cleaners, or I just turned 65 and I'm getting ads for condos in, in, in Florida, Florida group <laughs> or cohort. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. kind of putting them all together in these, these little groups and then marketing to them, mm-hmm. which is very similar to what cookies do. It's just it's <laughs> so not much different, right? It's not so there's a a, there's the personal. right. The main difference is that they're saying it's like not as personal, but 
The privacy experts are Did like, they say, though, that I can go it. and look at my topic and who I'm in and can I change my topics or alter so them? You yeah. can, so that's kind of the, the cool thing. Advertisers yeah. hate topics because they can't actually see what you're clicking in right, the same right. way that they could with cookies. No, it's, I'm sure they don't like it. Yeah, it's not going to. But you do have some control over some of the stuff that you well, can that's change. That's a good step, right? Which I is guess. kind of cool. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I, yeah. But I think Apple's, I mean, aren't they completely, I mean, they're, yeah. they're saying no, no to all of this and we're blocking it. And uh, duck, duck, go. Is that the other one that came out? Uh, to, well, that's like a search. To, yeah. But it's to crush Chrome, all its prying eyes, right? Isn't that the whole premise uh, yeah. behind it? Yeah. Apple and Microsoft, like even the Brave browser, which I guess replaced Internet Explorer um, and Apple Safari, like they're, they're not, they don't care for this and they don't, doesn't really seem like they have any plan to implement it or utilize it and without them i mean it's pretty tough to like so it's safe to say we're going to have future episodes all dealing with this quite a few times because it's not going to flush itself out anytime soon right oh yeah it's yeah yeah. they say 2023 chrome will stop like collecting cookies yeah because they can that as you just said they don't need them right but oh yeah a it's lot gonna, of time for a lot to change in yeah. between there so i'm curious yeah. to see what happens as we kind of you know traipse into the into the future um so that, that kind of brings us to i think something that we've been kind of saying throughout the episode is mm-hmm. is asking is asking better like would you rather be asked or is just knowing the information like does it Does it matter? There are kind of some pros and cons when you're trying to properly identify it from a technical standpoint and collect the data and then have them easily identify themselves. And, and, you know, I, you know, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm really like, why aren't we asking? Right. But on the other hand, if you're searching around the internet and you're just going from site to site to site to site, I don't think you want to be hit with 1500 surveys, you know, a day on, you know, it, that wouldn't make sense either. But I think right. if you engage with a brand and that's what we're really talking about, let's be, let's get it back down to earth. We're talking about merchants who have a website that they're selling products and they have a brand and, and cause you know, that's kind of who we're really talking about. Well, in that case, you get a relationship with that brand, maybe not your first time there, but if you really like the brand, I think, yeah, why are we not asking? That's the point I'm really at. I mean, why are we trying to guess everything? And it just, to me, I guess I just don't get it because I think people would give up their info if they knew they'd get a better shopping experience. And maybe that's the problem. Maybe they've been asked all these survey questions and it never changes their experience, you know, and well, maybe. Good. No, no, I'm just, I'm wondering why, <clears throat> why there's a hesitation for it. Maybe, or maybe the marketers don't know what to do with the data. And just I think it it's a combination of like all of it. Like there's a lot of data, what to do with it. There needs to be some machine learning and some AI to kind of like help make some of these decisions because it's too much for missing. marketers to juggle. That's exactly what I think is missing. Cause, um, one of the, one of my, mentors many 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 years ago but long before some of this technology even existed said you know because i was eager to just ask all these surveys and send out questions and then they do even printed surveys you know and he said well what are you going to do with that data you know and it i think it you know sometimes you need that data to help you make better business decisions but sometimes you're just asking questions you're not going to do anything with well it creates um, more work sometimes right well, I, I, no, clearly they weren't going to do anything with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think you're right. If, if there was something that's running in the background, that's crunching that data, you do, using that data and helping, uh, I think more marketers would do it. And I think more people would fill it out. Right. Um, or even giving su- like suggestions to, mm-hmm. On what to, to suggestions yeah. to like, or insights for the marketer, for the company, for the store. Right. to know and then they kind of act on those a little bit and then that is felt on the consumer side and that's like, like trickle down um yeah. well think of the world I, I i use this analogy right i don't have any pets right now i mean in my life and i don't have any babies in my life right i mean you I got a lot of on. plants though a lot of plants. I have a lot of plants right so i go to certain sites I think of how better my experience would be if they would just get rid of that stuff i mean i could always find it and ask for it why is it always, that's the problem I have with Amazon too. It's, it's always in my face. I don't mind. I don't mind having it. If the problem is I don't really 
want to see it all the time and have to navigate around it. Yeah. And if somebody would just ask me, I mean, clearly they're not getting the message with my browser history, <laughs> history. but, um, but I mean, maybe if they just asked me then and said, well, can I create a personal experience for you? If I asked you a few questions, I would be the first in line going, yeah, please. And, so um, what are the drawbacks? Like we, let's say we collect, we have the data and we collect it. What are some of the drawbacks of like identifying a user or a shopper when they come to your store? You know, it's an well, extra step for the customer to somehow identify themselves. And it's an extra step for the marketer to do something about their programming or the way they're delivering something, right? So they're right. And I think does that frustrate customers that they have to log in? Like I hate when like before I go to make a purchase and they're like, you must create an account. I hate that. I, I, that drives me nuts. But if you had something like a cookie, you know, or I, I think you left off the third one before I get to that, though, is I think the third part is being able to edit that data. I, I, I think that's kind of where we're going to get to, because just because you can build it and just because they'll give you the answers. But if we don't allow the consumer to change or look at or even, you know, acknowledge it, or be transparent about it, I think it's going to be doomed to fail. And then the last part was, you know, if you have a cookie or something like it, maybe you don't have to log in, John. I mean, maybe there's a to magical token thing that we carry around with us. You know, we well, uh, yeah, use I, tokens. I think that's so in the in the future, right? So a lot of times right. now they will drop like queries and uh, pieces of code into links that will identify you as like a, it's a soft profile. So right. like you're getting a lot of the recommendations and you're getting your first piece of your profile that's public, you're not getting all the order history. I think Amazon, you said, uh, did this to you the other day. You had to log in to actually see your order history again, right. even though you were kind of already logged Just in. Half logged in, right. Yeah, yeah. like a, a mini or soft you know, profile. Right. Um, but I, I think one of the interesting things will be in the future is how you easily identify yourself. If we are bringing it all up front and we are being open about it, you, you know, maybe it's as easy as putting your phone number in like Shopify does this really well. When you check out, you put your phone number in. You don't really need a password. The code that they give you is your password to your account. And it takes two seconds. Like that two, it's like the, not even a two-step. It's a, um, what do they call it with the text? It's with a text message to your device. Yeah. I, well, I think uh, a lot of marketers also use, this, this, terribly fall into this trap where they ask for information they don't need or the consumer doesn't understand why you need it now. I cannot tell you how many forms you go to and tell me your address, tell me all this info. You know what? If I actually order from you, you're going to get all that. Why do you need that now? You know, obviously like you need it. To, yeah. Right. So it's more like asking the right thing. You should be asking me, do I have any pets? Do I have any, you know, or do I like plants or, you know, it could be a positive or a negative, but you should not be asking me for some information. I'm not going to give you until I order. Right. I mean, there's, so there's some also, I think it's sometimes the questions we ask and how we ask them. People don't want to be tracked by everybody. It would be, but if I had a token, right back to your original point, I would be in control over it. So, yeah, um, that that goes to the the. If we're talking about the future, future like yes, you know, what does it look like in the future? Yeah. Is that like your custom model or profile? You're calling it a token, whatever it is that identifies you, and right. it has your public facing information and it has your private information. Um, and getting rid of the behind the scenes stuff and sort of like pulling it to the front, but it has to be done in an, an elegant way yeah, that isn't, isn't interfering with the shopping e experience and adds to it. Or you, what you were kind of leading on to is if you don't know why they're asking the question, sometimes that's, that's annoying. But like, if you yeah. know, oh, I'm, oh, oh, I see. Now you're going to use that data to do X, Y, and Z for me. Oh, I like that. Now I'll give you my phone number because I want those text updates to let me know when it's been delivered. So there's less of a chance of my package getting stolen. Or my zip code, <laughs> right. Or my zip code. You want to give me something targeted, but you don't need my full address. It's going to take me longer to fill that out. Just ask for my zip code. I mean, why? right. Or some of our customers yeah. with the garden zones, like yeah. make it clear that like, Oh, we're asking you this information For about your zip code right. to tell you your garden zone. People are like, wait, why do you need, which part do you need? But you're like, oh no, I need you. I'm going to use your zip code to give you the garden zone to then right. tell you what you want to grow in that garden zone. Um, nice so 
Yeah, and, and I think you have what your you know your mantra about like you know m is to collect the data. And for me, I'm saying to to start collecting the um, recommendation data or the machine learning data that's gathered on how your products interact with each other and how users interact with them to sort of start to build that relationship um, that's so true. Yeah. of the products. And for you, you start, right. what do you always say about the collecting data? Well, you better be able to use it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and that they need to do it now. You're always oh, saying, yes, like, yes. collect it now. Well, that's it. Collect it now because, well, the funny thing is you need to collect it now because you can't use it until the future. So, I mean, the biggest point about that is that um, if you wanted to plan in six months or a year to use personalization, you need to start, you know, surveying your customers now. You need to start, you know, collecting all that data because you can't just turn the switch on, right? Um, right. It's like chicken or the egg sometimes. Like you need the data to start making some AI and machine learning like predictions and yeah. calculations and recommendations, but it takes months. You, yeah. you need the data, but you also need the prediction engine. It's sort of like this chicken or the egg. You need both of them kind of. Um, I think we said it before. <clears throat> it's like, uh, I want to send text messages to all my customers. How many times do we get that? Right. And then we ask, well, how many do you have? And have you gotten permission? And the answer is zero. I said, well, you could start now and in six months, you know, but right. that's the point. You, right. you need to start collecting. And, and the idea is to collect them now, even though you're not using them so that you can then start marketing with it. But you must act first. And the same thing goes with AI and some of these you know, recommendations. Yeah, because people are going to get hit. I mean, like store owners and stuff, they're going to get slammed by it. And be like, wait, what? This happened overnight? It's going to start to explode. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah it's so coming. I guess it, in, in closing, mm -hmm. focus on watching what people are interested in. That's right. Focusing on asking them questions about what they're interested in. Them. Yep, get that engagement going. Engage with them. And then look at that data and then use it for something. That's right. And even if it's not today, think of, start to think of those start ideas. Small. Okay, how am I going to use this down the road? That's right. Think of your industry, your way, and think small. Start small, but start using it.